Great. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, it's about time to get started, so I may kick things off here. Um, if uh, certainly throughout the day, if you want to get up and grab more coffee or food or things like that, um, feel free to do that. But um, I'm Alex Primus, um, and uh, welcome to the uh, Minnesota Aquaponics Symposium of 2018. Um, just uh, before we get into some of the, the longer talks, I was just going to go over a few things and kind of an introductory talk. Um, first, I was going to kind of go over the schedule and some uh, logistics. So I think you all got a schedule of what's coming up. But basically, this morning, um, we'll have a couple talks, one on water quality, one on fish health. We'll take a little break. Uh, and then we'll come back for a couple more talks, one on uh, plant production. And then uh, we have a guest from Urban Organics here who's going to tell us about their operation, um, which is pretty impressive if you haven't seen it yet. Um, and then we will have an hour and a half for lunch. And then during that time, if you could go look at the posters. The students who made the posters are all in an aquaponics class right now. And they'll be here standing in front of the posters. You can ask them questions and things like that. Um, before we head up the hill, we'll all come back together and sit down. We'll ask you guys questions about the posters. Uh, and there are prizes for people who get them right. Um, and then we'll basically head up the hill to the greenhouses. And up there, we have three different stations where we'll be doing kind of hands-on demonstrations. So one on water quality, one on fish health, and one on uh, plant pest and disease management. Uh, each of those stations will be about 25 minutes. And then we'll kind of rotate you. and. Uh, You'll be in a group based on, uh, you should have a little uh, dot on your name tag with a color. And so we'll split you up based on the colors of your dots, basically into three groups. Um, so we'll do that for about an hour and a half. Uh, and then we'll come back together, have some closing remarks. And if people want to stick around after that and see uh, the aquaponic systems we have up there in a little more detail, we'll do some tours at that point as well. So any questions about the schedule? Nope, great. So I also just wanted to make sure we were all on the same page before we get into some more details. Um, let me ask real quick, how many of you guys have, um, have run your own aquaponics systems? So a handful. Uh, how many of you guys understand the basic concepts of aquaponics? So most of you. So this will be, uh, I'll probably not be telling you too much new, but I just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. So aquaponics is basically a hybridization of hydroponics and aquaculture. So, um, and, and recirculating aquaculture in particular. So recirculating aquaculture uh, is, is like a giant fish tank, basically, for fish production. So uh, it's an enclosed, intensive fish production system where you reuse the water uh, that goes through the system, filter it and reuse it. And then hydroponics is a soilless system of plant production um, but you, it requires that you add a lot of nutrients to the system. And aquaponics is a hybridization of those two, basically. It has three major biological components. So uh, your aquatic animals, typically fish, uh, which excrete ammonia as waste. But that ammonia is toxic to them, so it needs to be broken down, and eventually uh, those metabolites need to be removed from the system one way or another. In aquaponics, you also have uh, bacteria, which make up your biofilter. And they are going to break the ammonia down to nitrite and then nitrate, which are less toxic for fish. But they still need to be removed from the system at some point. Uh, the third uh, component, biological component, are going to be the plants. And so the plants actually will remove much of that nitrate from the system. Um, and so it's kind of that, that synergism between all of these different biological components uh, that makes the system uh, sustainable and functional, more or less. Um, I threw in a couple slides here just to show you um, kind of some of the, the demographics of aquaponics. Um, so in a paper in, I think, 2015 by uh, Love et al., uh, they, asked, um, they put out a survey asking people about uh, aquaponics. So where are people doing aquaponics? What are they doing in aquaponics and things like that? And it was international. I'm just showing a map of the US here. Um, but you can see on the right hand side here that um, the number of respondents saying that they are involved with aquaponics um, grew pretty significantly 
uh, from 2000 to uh, 2012, 2013, something like that. So there has been a lot of growth in aquaponics. And then the map just kind of shows where, where some of that growth has taken place. Uh, it's hard to see, but um, in Minneapolis and St. Paul, it does have one of those bigger dots that represents kind of two to four respondents. Um, one of the reasons that aquaponics has grown a great deal is because it is a fairly sustainable system of food production. Uh, so it, especially when compared to more traditional food production systems. So uh, they use less water and uh, produce less wastewater than a lot of food production systems. Uh, there's reduced use uh, or need of herbicide, pesticide, and fertilizer. Um, and reduced land use um, and transport costs and transport wastes, I guess because you can do this sort of thing uh, in the middle of a city. There are, I just have a couple more slides, so uh, hopefully I'm not uh, putting anyone to sleep yet. Um, so there are three, uh, three, there are several basic types of aquaponic systems. I'm gonna show off three of the more popular, and they differ in, in their construction primarily based on how the plants are situated in the system. So one basic type of system is media-based, where you basically have your plants growing in some sort of media that uh, the water from the fish tank will flow through. Um, there is something called a deep water system, where your plants are actually growing on a little raft that is floating on the top of uh, a water surface uh, that has water, once again, recirculating with the fish tank. And the third most common uh, type is uh, this nutrient film type which often involves PVC pipes, doesn't need to, but basically has just a very thin layer of water floating past the roots of your plants that are uh, dipping down into the water and pulling nutrients out of it. Um, you can add, these are kind of some basic systems. You can add a lot of things to the systems if you need. Uh, that can include different types of filtration, uh, heaters or chillers if you need lighting and things like that. And they come in all, all sorts of sizes, basically. So everything from uh, a tiny little uh, beta tank um, that you can grow some herbs on to uh, a very large system in the bottom right-hand corner here um, is the University of Virgin Islands system and kind of everything in between, uh, stuff in your backyard, uh, things like that. I just thought I'd throw this up there. This is from the Love Paper as well, and it's, uh, it's showing the number of respondents, the frequency of respondents that were growing certain types of fish, just to show you what most people are growing in aquaponic systems. And so the most popular is, uh, is tilapia, based on this survey. Um, second uh, is ornamental fish, which is primarily going to be koi. And from there, it kind of falls off a bit. Um, there's still a lot of people growing catfish, perch, bluegill, trout, things like that in systems. Um, but the most two common, uh, at least based on this survey and probably from my experience as well, um, would be tilapia and things like koi. One of the reasons for that is that um, they're very hardy fish. It's hard, to, uh, it's hard to mess up too badly and have fish issues. Whereas if you're dealing with a, a, a fish that's not as hardy, uh, you can make one very small mistake and lose all your fish very quickly. And then in terms of plants, um, you know, the, a lot of the leafy vegetables are very popular in aquaponic systems. Um, but things like tomatoes, peppers, um, and strawberries um, are not uncommon as well. Um, so that was everything I had for my intro. So uh, I just want to thank you guys for coming. Um, we will, uh, at the end of each talk, we'll have a few minutes for, for questions. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions now. Uh, there was one other thing I was going to say, uh, but I can't remember it right now. So um, any questions on what I've presented so far? OK, great. And uh, we can probably move on to our next talk, which is going to be uh, Matt Smith from uh, Ohio State University. Um, is going to talk about water quality. Morning. All right, uh, so my name is Matt Smith. Uh, as you just mentioned, um, this is all being recorded as one thing that didn't get mentioned, so it all will be posted online, uh, both through Ohio State University as well as University of Minnesota, uh, as well as um, 
the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center's uh, 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 pages as well. It's just nickrack.org. Uh, and I, I give a nod to them, and they're, they're kind of all throughout. But this is a USDA-funded project, and it's the reason we got to do the fourth um, uh, annual symposium here. So appreciate you all coming out. I do have a lot to talk about. If I go fairly quickly, the reason is, is that you should all know a lot of your, your basics. And then a lot of this, uh, or not all, a lot of this, but all of this is recorded for you to review over. And then, of course, ask us questions during the hands-on portion or during the tours later on. So if you have any questions, feel free to let me know. There's some, uh, especially with this being a diverse group, we've got some undergrad students. Some people are just interested, and some people are already doing it. So there are some rudimentary uh, answers here or questions that are going to be answered here, and then some things that are slightly more uh, advanced. But if you have questions, feel free to let me know. So of course, like everything, and I've given this uh, sort of talk, sim a similar talk before, but like anything, it can be quite overwhelming, especially if you're just uh, starting to get into it. So hopefully, as someone who's an extension specialist, I hope you take um, uh, heed to a lot of advice and not just look at scientific papers or general YouTube clips, especially those that aren't backed by universities and things of that nature. But hopefully, you take your time to read your, it's called SHRAC, Southern Regional Aquaculture Center. A lot of the publications out there, because they're very scientific driven, they're all backed by, uh, uh, by scientific publications and resources. But they're in ways that you can, uh, uh, of course, understand. You don't have to have a PhD in water quality to understand them, which I do not. I have no degrees in fish uh, in water quality, but it's something that I find to be uh, very important for all. So hopefully you take your time to understand and kind of see uh, all the types of publications out there. But we appreciate you all being here, and hopefully that you have come to uh, a great deal of these types of, of workshops to ask the people who are writing these extension publications and then, of course, if you don't know, there's uh, what they call basically the, the holy grail of small-scale aquaculture or aquaponic production put on by the United Nations. It's uh, about 500 pages or so, but basically any question you can think of, at least for small scale, is going to be involved uh, and, and posted. And that's a free publication to download, um, um, but it, it really gives you a good start. But, of course, we all know that only goes so far. You actually have to go through and test the water quality yourself with various different parameters you got to stock your fish regardless of what it, uh, what it may be, and there are stressors on that animal. And a lot of what I talk about is stress and limiting the stress on the animals, which I think is a good precursor to the fish health talk that follows. But of course, after you've stocked them, you've got to manage them as they're actually in that system. Uh, and the one in the top middle with the, the young couple is actually an aquaponic system. And then should something go wrong, they had algae takeover in this little aquaponic system it was in in high school, but um, uh, the algae really took off. Of course, they're just using up nutrients and everything else. So how do you correct that in a way that um, allows for the, those nutrients to be reused for the, the plants as well as uh, limiting stress on the animals? And then, of course, you've got to go through and harvest them. And there are stressors and things to, th to think about, both pre-harvest uh, once you're harvesting them, and as well as if you're actually going to transport them afterwards, you want to limit the stress at all steps. But all this is going to depend on what your goals are. And no matter what the topic is, whether it's fish health, whether it's uh, how much money or, or kind of uh, basic system considerations for developing your system, it's all going to develop on your goals. You know, are you just educating? Are you just a small-scale hobbyist? Um, are you just trying to supply your family? Are you going to be uh, an investor? Whatever you're going to do is going to determine what, what your goals are looking like. As we know, though, if you're uh, going to be a small-scale hobby, there are some things you're just going to be less worried about. It doesn't mean that you want your plants to die, that you want your fish to die, or anything like that. But we all know that time is money, labor is money, things of that nature. So you've got to kind of invest accordingly. And then, of course, oops, I'm sorry. And then, of course, if it's a full-time venture, you're going to have to, uh, of course, basically up everything. You're going to have higher rates of everything. Uh, I'll bet it's going to be at appropriate rates. But you're going to be a lot more worried about stress, uh, both on yourself, uh, but the animals as well. Because even in a, in a well-designed aquaponic system, especially if you don't have backup generators or things of that, uh, it's very stressful not knowing uh, whether or not you're going to wake up in the morning and find out that you've lost power or something of that nature, and then now all of a sudden you've lost a few thousand pounds of fish. So when and what to test for, a lot of this stuff is, um, and I stress these next couple slides because it really does depend on your own personal system. Unfortunately, it's not uh, uh, kind of 
broken out in the way that really our, our chicken industry has been in. You know, I'm not going to sell you the system with that exact amount of feed, and I'm going to pick them up on this day. There are so many variables, especially as Alex mentioned, if there's different types of systems, if you've invested a different amount of money. Um, but a lot of the things depending on the type of system, the farmer's experience with that particular system, uh, even if you have someone who is, or, or even a hobbyist, if you work with a small little flood and drain 55-gallon drum media bed system, uh, and you have uh, basically conquered that in every situation, you try to move to a flood and drain system or an NFT system or whatever it may be, especially if it's a new system, uh, you're going to uh, have different, uh, you're going to need to spend different times, especially as you're getting to know that system, um, because there are so many different variables and things to worry about. Particularly with NFTs, we won't get into it too much, but we know if you just do a thin stream of water there and if it's not properly filtered out with all those heavy settable solids, you know, those roots can really gunk up quite quickly, which if you're doing a media bed, it might not be as big of a deal, especially if you have worms or something there to help you kind of uh, compost that system. What do the records say? If you know that historically you've had uh, a problem with your fish at this time of year or at this age, um, or if you have uh, kind of chronically high ammonia or whatever it is, you're of course going to test a little bit more. So I hate saying that these are exact times. Uh, and then of course you want to know, have they been moved recently or are you about to move them? I showed this slide in Iowa a couple months back for the next couple slides, but basically why we test is because of the stress of the animals. And once again, this is all about your uh, time and investment in it. But as we know, as humans and as kind of an extension specialist, we kind of utilize stuff that is uh, uh, understandable to people who don't have a, a huge amount of experience in a topic. But one thing we all know is stress on ourselves, whether you're an undergraduate student and you're taking, graduate ex or you're taking your exams, uh, whether you are uh, standing in front of an audience and you're very stressed out, maybe you have a nervous headache or something like that, of that nature. But of course, there's longer term things, you know, your risk of heart attack increasing, uh, high blood sugar and things like that. So there's a difference between the two. Alex talks about this as well, but this is more of an acute stress. You know, I'm being chased around, um, uh, the caveman's being chased around. This is something that's bothering me right now. My heart's going to start racing and all those types of things. That's more my acute stress. Versus a chronic stress can be your fun drive to work, your annoying boss, uh, which might be the world's best boss. It could be a difficult spouse. Those types of things kind of occurs over time, right? So it's understandable that there are two different types of stressors for ourselves. That's the same thing with the fish also. Poor water quality does make life difficult. You know, we, we tell you and, and we desire and we're going to show you a piece of paper later on that says, really, you should test this often, this often, this often. I know that I know that I know that most people are, might, they're going to test their temperature, they're going to test their pH, they might test dissolved oxygen, but other than that, they might not do anything else. And a lot of times, we're unfortunately lucky if they do that much. Once again, it's your time and investment, but we hope you spend time to, to kind of adhere. Am I, am I loud enough? No? Yes, no? Well, I'll hold this just in case. Is that better? Worse? Can you hear me? OK. Um, got me off track here. All right, so poor water quality is often a stressor for, or, or often uh, kind of a, a trigger for something worse, I guess would be the best words. That's why I put it in there. Um, but it's just going to invite other troubles. You know, I'm not the fish health expert. We do have fish health experts in here, and they'll be glad to elaborate on this. Uh, but basically, say you have an aquaponic system we were talking earlier, and you get your fish from an outdoor system. Well, there could be undesirable species in there. There could be pathogens, bacteria, or, or one thing we, we're going to be worried about is parasites. Well, even if it's a moderate load of parasites, it may ne never negatively affect that animal if the water quality is, is, is very high. However, uh, if ammonia gets too high, nitrite, whatever it may be, pH gets off, and your animals start ge getting stressed, well, those parasites or whatever pathogens in the water is just going uh, to be compounded. And then, of course, the next three bullets, uh, it's just a stepping stone. You know, your un unhealthy animals uh, or, or your stressed fish, they're not going to grow well. If they're not growing well, they're not going to eat much. They're not going to produce a lot of waste um, or enough waste because they're not eating a whole lot. And, of course, if... Uh, um, if you're not producing enough nutrients, your plants gonna, aren't going to grow. And especially if you're trying to make money at that, we all know that uh, a great deal of your money is going to come from the plant side of things. So uh, it's really an economic uh, uh, multiplication onto the factors that can really hurt your system. And so we always uh, talk about being proactive and not necessarily reactive. 
One thing that does get stressful when we talk about water quality being um, uh, overwhelming is that there are many complex interactions that are related to them. It's not just temperature and that's all you got to worry about. It's not just pH. It's not just alkalinity. But one of the things you want to do, and I, I say that kind of at the bottom, didn't say, but you got to start with good quality in the first place. Uh, and there's a reason why we, we throw this slide here. I'm not going to harp on it too hard, but start with good water quality. Know the risk of using surface water versus well water versus city water that's been treated, rainwater, things of that nature. Just understand that there are positives and negatives, and we all know that you're going to use what's most economical for you and what you can get your hands on. And as I precursor this, and that's why I'm glad this is being recorded, not necessarily just shown online, because a lot of times if you just see a PowerPoint, regardless of who it's from, there's a lot of things get, can, that can be misconstrued. But basically what we're looking at as, is an example. And so it's something that we want to say that uh, this all depends on the age of your system, the farmer's experience, and so forth. But here's some of your daily, weekly, bi-weekly, uh, bi or monthly systems, uh, as well as monthly uh, parameters. Same thing goes here, just as an example of what you would see. Some things you're going to do multiple times a day and so forth, and so we'll get kind of dive into each of these parameters uh, uh, right now. For those parameters that you do decide to monitor all the time, and it, once again, it depends on your investment and things of that nature, um, but basically you're going to want to uh, hopefully at least have some type of system. There are some uh, of your cheaper titration kits or your uh, drop-wise counters that you can use uh, that are fairly, uh, fairly cheap. But of course, the more money you're investing, the more time you're investing, the more of an actual venture and not necessarily a hobby it is, the more you're going to want to invest in actual dissolved oxygen meters or even automated systems that will alert your phone, that will email you, that will alert your whoever's on deck uh, to go and take care of that system. And then just as, as an example, for those parameters, maybe you'd know that uh, iron, as an example, is, is, is pretty readily used up in your system. There are some folks that will go through and use dosing pumps. They'll mix that chelated iron in a system and have it slowly dose into that system so that they don't have to test it as regularly because they know it's dropping the exact amount of nutrients into that water that I might need, be needing, which it's an investment to buy the pump. It's a, uh, it, it takes some calculation to figure it out but it's also less times that I have to go back through and test for iron or whatever it may be. For those that are doing less than daily, there's a bunch of different ways to look at it, uh, but for whether it be your nitrogen compounds, your alkalinity, hardness, whatever it may be, uh, there are some really cheap stuff to some really expensive stuff. We're not going to harp on it too much, but it all is all in how much time and energy you want to invest. So why are we testing more than others? Basically a bunch of lines on here, but uh, the, the bottom line is that some things are going to uh, uh, be able to uh, change very abruptly, and then some things are going to change over time. For example, your oxygen can certainly crash to zero or close to zero uh, very quickly in an intensive system. Uh, we have, uh, it's not uncommon to, to see, even in aquaponics, especially when it's actual farm, for that oxygen to drop to zero in less than 20 minutes. And we've had farms, even been in Ohio, we've got farms where that's been the case. So if I'm really a, a, a hardcore farmer and that's what I'm doing and that's why I'm trying to bring the money in, I'm going to have the backup generator. Maybe eventually I'm going to invest in an automated system and things of that nature to help me. And then uh, some things like alkalinity, you know, pH and temperature is kind of the change, uh, kind of the same, although pH does change a little bit slower. Uh, but things like alkalinity, um, things like that are going to change over time. However, in a recirculating system, and I get into this more here in just a little bit, uh, but alkalinity is going to continuously be knocked back in a recirculating system in all systems, but more, uh, but faster in an RAS system or in an aquaponic system. So you got to understand uh, buffering of those, uh, of those parameters. So some things are just happening faster than others. So I won't spend too much time on these, but there are some rudimentary stuff to understand as you start to move forward. But basically, as I mentioned with the stress, we are homeotherms, so we self-regulate, keep it around that 98.6. Some of us run a little hotter. But those fish, poikilothermic, kind of getting a, a little bit of an outdated term, but basically just means that whatever temperature the water is, uh, or really the air, uh, whatever the temperature of the water is, that's going to be the temperature of your animals which means that's uh, either going to be a good thing or a bad thing for them. We talked earlier, if you're using tilapia in here, uh, it was mentioned, you know, you might have to fight the cold for nine months out of the year, uh, and then you've got those uh, kind of the warmer months for, the, uh, for those three months. So you've got to figure out species selection, things of that nature, which we won't get into too much. 
This particular system um, uh, is going to have in the top left corner, that's you heating the water. Top right corner, uh, they call it the beast, you're heating the air. And a lot of your folks are going to heat both of them to help to keep from any, uh, uh, they call it thriller effects, any, any dense fogs in your systems if you have too much of a difference. Tilapia is an example, we use this quickly, uh, but I've used it several times, so we'll stick with it. Uh, if it's too hot, they're going to spend all their energy just basically covering their costs to survive. So no matter how much feed you're pouring into this system, if it's just entirely too hot, which you're probably not going to have to worry about in Minnesota, um, but if you do, then they're just going to constantly consume that feed. But everything they're going to consume, uh, it's all related to the bioenergetics model, they're just going to be covering their costs to survive and not necessarily packing on the weight that you really want, right? Because you want them to pack on a lot of good fillet yield, uh, or if it's a different species, it might be length and just weight in general. If it's too cold, the metabolism, metabolism is generally going to be too low, and they might, um, they're going to require very little feed just to cover their cost to survive, but they're not necessarily going to have the desire or the need to eat much more than just kind of the minimum to cover those rations, so it's going to uh, uh, hinder growth there as well. If it's within range, and that's a lot of times what you see is kind of within a tolerable range, uh, you're going to see that they're going to grow okay, they're going to be pretty healthy, and be fairly less stressed than what you're actually doing. Unfortunately, what we should be thriving for, and this is all an investment, how much time and en energy you're going to invest, but if it's optimal. And we, for this example, did temperature, but it could be pH, it could be anything under the sun. But basically, if it's optimal temperature in this range, you're going to get substantially more growth out of your animals and we all know if they're growing faster, if they're eating uh, more, they're going to be producing more waste for the plants. Uh, but also that's less risk on the farmer or the hobbyist side if they're getting that fish to market as quickly as possible, getting it out the door to help with cash flow so that they can stock new fish in there as quickly as possible. And of course they're going to die outside in many mis uh, Midwestern states. Uh, I'll do uh, dissolved oxygen and pH and then we'll shift scales a little, uh, shift uh, uh, gears a little bit. We all know oxygen is necessary to survive. Uh, he showed the plants, the fish, and the, uh, uh, the bacteria earlier. They all need oxygen. They're all necessary. They all need each other, well, at least the bacteria and the, and the fish. Um, um, but basically, we all understand that it's going to use up uh, uh, oxygen through aer aerobic processes. Uh, we want to keep the basically milligrams per liter or parts per million, depending on cooler, warm water species. But we're going to keep this uh, basically at saturation if possible. Uh, and that's going to depend on a lot of things that I talked about in a second. But you've got to check DO all over the system, especially in an aquaponic system, and um, uh, to a lesser extent to an RAS and to a lesser extent in a pond. And that's just because a lot of times there's a lot of different curves and changes in an aquaponic system that might say uh, uh, to offer the chances for dead zones. And we want to make sure to limit that as much as possible, especially when we're worried about for if maybe we're already nitrogen limited already. You can get denitrification, talk about that in a, uh, in a minute, uh, but basically you're bleeding off nitrogen gas, which is the exact opposite of what we want to happen if we might be nitrogen limited. And I mentioned quickly, won't spend much time on it, but as the water gets warmer, the amount of oxygen that can be held in that system is going to decline. pH, basically how acidic or, or basic something is, each have their own ranges, uh, each species has their own ranges as well as bacteria, plants, and fish and then limit those pH swings because it's going to be quite stressful on the animals. I borrowed this slide from Bill Lynch, um, but basically what we're looking at, and there are some general considerations for everything, but we want to get as much overlap as possible so that we can grow the most amount of bacteria, the most amount of plants, and the most amount of fish kind of in harmony. We all know that there's going to be limitations both on the micro and macronutrients as well of the plants, and what's going to be more available than not, uh, but as a general scale just for the bacteria, plants, and fish. We, uh, that's why we see a lot of folks shooting for, uh, for that 7 pH. So ammonia and nitrite, the pH, temperature, oxygen, that's all pretty easy to see. Uh, ammonia, a lot of times you see it, uh, it can get quite stressful, especially if you're not understanding between an ionized ammonia, ionized nitrite, nitrate, and those types of things. What we see a lot of times is ammonia being uh, recorded is as NH3 and NH4+. Uh, plus. These are basically our unionized and our ionized forms. So the unionized stuff is the stuff we're really worried about as far as toxic toxicity goes, and then to a lesser extent, our ionized form. So a lot of times when you see uh, your ammonia, if it's three or four milligrams per liter or parts per million, 
as a whole, it may not mean anything if your pH is at the, uh, at the appropriate rate, and I'll dive into in a second. Um, but what we're really worried about is the unionized form and then the nitrite form. But understand what the forms are and know what's safe for your, your species, because some are more tolerant than others. Uh, he mentioned catfish. They're a little bit more uh, hardy, uh, and they use remediations. But there are, some, there are some species that are a lot more hardy to nitrite poisoning or unionized uh, uh, ammonia poisoning. However, with the uh, things like yellow perch that we've been dealing with the last couple of years in Ohio, or at least myself is, they're quite susceptible to the unionized ammonia. So whereas if we could do a catfish up to one milligram per liter, these guys might be, or 0.10, uh, these guys are going to need less than 0.05. Uh, and the numbers are kind of uh, just to allow you to understand that each species is very specific. So you got to know your species, know the records, do your due diligence to understand what you're working with. I'm glad we have the, uh, uh, the screens because I get that it's fairly small. But this is generally for a fish pond, but a lot of the same reactions, or the same reactions are happening in our aquaponic system. We're going to feed these fish, uh, especially when it's a, a prepared diet you're going to have that total ammonia being produced, which bacteria are going to use to convert to nitrite, which other bacteria are going to use to convert to nitrate. And a lot of times that's where it stops and it's, it's taken up. However, if, if you do have a denitrification area, you can see that that gets volatized and ends up as nitrogen gas and, and bleeds off into the system. This is a Shrack publication, 463. There's a lot of great information there. If you have more questions about it, we can chat. This was developed for a fish pond, but it's a lot of the same considerations. We're not going to actually do the calculation here, but as I mentioned, specifically what we're worried about uh, when we're talking about just ammonia in general is the unionized form. The two big factors that we have here are the pH and the temperature, and we see as the pH increases and the temperature increases, the amount of ammonia, so I mentioned the four earlier. You know, if you have a very low pH uh, and a very low temperature, more of that's going to be in the non-toxic form, so we're not going to be as worried about it. That's why a lot of folks try to sit around 7 as well to limit the amount that's in that harmful form. We're not going to do the calculations for time, but basically there's several online calculators to help you figure out. You can plug in your temperature, you can plug in your pH and your ammonia, and it'll spit out the unionized form for you. Or you can go through and calculate it yourself. Uh, this particular one, or, or actually what you really should have with all of these unionized calculators, you can't take your temperature one day, your pH another day, and your ammonia the other day. All of this needs to be recorded at the same time to give you the most accurate reading. And it's small, but once again, this is being recorded. The American Fisheries Society has a great deal, especially with their last hatchery management publications. A lot of free calculators on there that talks about oxygen supersaturation and how to account for that in your system or how much is in that system. Uh, but a whole host of free tables and calculators that you can go back and reference to later on and find out what's actually uh, good for you. I think I still got a lot of slides to go, so I'll go as quickly as I can on some of this. Uh, but basically what we're worried about with the direct nutrients that are coming from the fish, uh, we've got our settable solids and then our dissolved solids. Uh, it's a pretty easy concept to understand. Uh, you basically take a scoop of water, uh, as an example, especially if it's a concentrated uh, part or the effluent from the fish area, let that glass of water sit for an hour. Whatever settles down to the bottom in that hour, that's more of your settable solids, the stuff that's very easy to settle out. And then you have the dissolved nutrients that are going to tend to take much more, uh, for instance, ammonia. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to remove out of that system. So we're going to remove the settable solids first, and then we're going to worry about the other stuff. That's why we talk about clarifiers or swirl filters coming before moving bed bioreactors bio or, um, uh, or some type of biofiltration where all the nitrification, not all, but a great deal of the nitrification is going to occur. Don't memorize this because this is another SRAC publication, which is fantastic. I try to reference these when I can because they're free for you to go back and, and find yourself. The good thing to note here, and this isn't a dual drain system, this is particularly recirculating, but all the little booms are places where filtration occurs. And that's really a big thing. You know, you might have a, a decent portion of that size dedicated to the fish, but those fish or shrimp or whatever you have are not going to thrive in that system without proper filtration. As Alex mentioned, this is basically just a grown-up version of, um, um, of an aquarium that you'll have at your house with a small filtration and aeration on it. So if we understand that about a fourth to half of the feed that's added to our system is going to be excreted as solid waste by the fish, we've got to have some way to remove that uh, and be as efficient as possible. 
And as I mentioned, there's a reason we utilize swirl filters, clarifiers, whatever it may be, before we actually get into our, our nitrification area. And that's because it's very easy to let those settable solids settle out. It's a very passive system, or rather passive system, and it's easy to do. If we put the nitrification before that, uh, or as a lot of times you see with the uh, uh, kind of the, the ebb and flow designs or the media bed designs, it's all lumped into one. The problem is there's a lot of solids there that end up getting put into a system that could very easily be removed because while we need nutrients in our system, a lot of those nutrients are going to be those dissolved nutrients, not so much those heavy solid wastes that we have. There are ways to remediate that also, but basically what the slide gets to is that each different types of filter, the reason why we have so many types of filters is they're all going to be designed for their own specific purpose. If you had one catch-all, a lot of times that system gets overburdened quite quickly. And I won't go through this too much because I just mentioned it, uh, but basically you're creating, as you feed those fish, you're going to be using up alkalinity, you're going to be using up oxygen, but you're also going to be producing some stuff as well. And the carbon dioxide, the waste solids, and ammonia are all our big things that we're worried about in a, in a highly intensified, uh, intensified system. Deficiencies, you're going to utilize the typical, you don't have to, but a lot of folks, uh, especially on the commercial scale, are, are going to utilize a prepared diet. Um, and of course, you know, there, there's a lot of words here, but basically what we're getting at is the micro and macronutrients. We all know that sometimes we're deficient in some. Our most common by far are going to be your calcium, iron, and potassium. Uh, but there are boron, magnesium types of deficiencies as well, of course. But the reason are is that these fish feeds are just that. They are fish feeds. They are not aquaponic feeds, right? So they're designed for fish, and any deficiencies that you might have on the plants are going to be because it's not designed for that species. I work for the university. I don't recommend any products or anything of that nature. But the only one I know of is there is an, actually an aquaponic-specific diet that is attempted to over-fortify in some of these nutrients that are usually deficient to help on a, out on that system. Anybody who knows Charlie Schultz, he has done some research uh, at Santa Fe Community College looking at uh, this specific diet. I've never worked with it or anything like that, but that's your basic principles, and that's why you have these deficiencies is because of the, both the fish feeds uh, as well as how well designed your system is. You got to record your results. Uh, recording it means absolutely nothing. You can put it in your head all you want to, but eventually all the pHs are going to run together. Um, record your results. Excel is extremely easy to use, especially for some of these basic things. You want to test on site. Uh, I'm running to the end of my time, but basically uh, you got to record right then and there. Uh, working at Ohio State, if you lived in Ohio and you sent me a water sample and said, hey, will you test this for me? I'm not going to do it all the time, but will you test it for me today? Sure, I'll test it, but if I'm, at, if I'm in Minnesota for the week uh, or if I'm out of town for the week, and I come back, it's really pointless for me to go through and test this, right? Because we all know that this, just because you seal it up in a, in a bottle and, and ship it off to me, doesn't mean that it's just frozen in time, right? There's a lot of microbes in that system. All that make, basically means is that if you want me to check DO, great, DO is going to be different. pH is going to be different. Carbon dioxide is going to be different. The ammonia is going to be different. Alkalinity is probably going to be quite similar to what, uh, what you put it in the bottle is. But the problem is you need to test on site and as soon as possible. Uh, to help you. And everything doesn't have to be really expensive. Uh, basically, take-homes uh, all depends on how much time and energy you want to invest. I keep mentioning that, but it really does harp. You know, we desire, if this is a venture and an and enterprise you're going after and, and desire to actually make money at this, or even if you just want to be a sustainable nonprofit, you've got to spend the time and money and energy um, and that labor that involves with that money and going through and recording some of the stuff that you want to have uh, and, and actually recording it, not just you know, writing down or not just testing DO, but actually writing it down and ch checking back on it over time. <coughs> there are a lot of suggested readings out there. Uh, this is the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center that has a ton of water quality stuff, but of course uh, uh, Dr. Leonard uh, has a great deal of uh, extension type publications, as well as the Yellow Book, uh, as everybody knows, is very, very common. And then, of course, Dr. Boyd and Dr. Tucker, they're all cat, those are water quality and catfish guys, but all of the same, not all of the same, it's mostly the same uh, a lot of times, no matter what type of system you're in, when you're really relying upon uh, trying to make money with the fish at high densities, using these uh, bacteria to break down the waste, um, a lot of it's the same. Thanks to our funding sponsors and everyone who helped out here today. 
I appreciate it. I might have two minutes for uh, questions. If not, I'll be around all afternoon as well. Thank you very much for your time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center. And into aquaponics or into aquaculture in general? Either? Well, Nick, Nick Rex has funded, uh, they're, they're all over. So actually, I'm on uh, the board of directors for Nick Rex. Alex is on uh, extension uh, sides. Nick Phelps, who's here, is on the research side. But Iowa State is represented, Wisconsin, Michigan. So we have uh, university folks that are recommended or, or represented. So that's called the, the Technical Committee for Research. And then there's the Technical Committee for Extension. But on the flip side of that, and this is the part that really matters, is we have an industry advisory council. So these are farmers who get nominated by various folks all throughout the 12 states. And so they all come together once or twice a year to help figure out what projects they're going to fund, where, where the interest lies. Um, you know, if, if VHS, if we had the VHS breakout, they come together to figure out how, what type of pro uh, projects do we fund to help to answer the questions. So they're down there a lot. It's just... It, it depends, I guess you got to know exactly where to look, but we are the Midwest. There is the Southern Regional, the East, or the Northern Regional. So we, well, they take care of the 12 states and they do the best that they can. Um, they've been around for 27 years and they're all, every year, every other year, they ask for people who are interested in being on the industry advisory council so they can come and offer their concerns, comments, things of that nature. So uh, if you're farming or interested in farming, I urge you, whatever state, if you're in Minnesota, Contact your extension folks and make sure you get nominated so you can get uh, uh, more involved too. Help answer your question? Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. I'm going to let uh, switch over to Alex. I appreciate you. Great. So um, now we are going to transition over to fish health and aquaponics. So I, I also have uh, a fair bit of information on here. Uh, fortunately, it's being recorded. So if I talk really fast, uh, you should be able to go back and look at parts of it if you want to. Um, I guess I didn't mention before, uh, I, I do work here at the University of Minnesota in the College of Veterinary Medicine, and I focus primarily on fish health um, in aquaculture in general, but uh, sometimes that, that becomes uh, fish health and aquaponics. So uh, over the next 25, 30 minutes, I'm going to go over um, a handful of things. I'm going to go over some fish health basics, give you my top 10 keys to keeping your fish healthy in an aquaponic system, uh, try and show you what some of the common indications of, um, of fish health issues are, uh, and some, go over a few basic models of disease progression, which are, are good to know um, if you're watching fish in a production system. Talk a little more about water quality and stress. I won't go into the detail that uh, Matt did, but um, we'll certainly um, go over how important it is in terms of fish health. Uh, I'll talk about nutrition and husbandry briefly, and then um, spend the rest of the time talking about infectious diseases of fish. <coughs> so uh, there are a lot of different fish species that can be grown. Um, in this talk, we're just talking about aquaponic systems. Uh, those, as I said, um, can vary quite a bit, maybe not quite as much as uh, in these photos. But there are a lot of different species and a lot of different systems. And so the health issues that may show up in one system with a certain species can be very different from something else, which makes a talk like this a little complicated. But hopefully I'll give you kind of a basic understanding that should help regardless of your system and species. So uh, first I'm going to go over my kind of top 10 keys to maintaining good fish health. The remainder of the talk, I'll, um, I'll kind of expand on some of those topics. So uh, number one thing, no doubt, good water quality. Um, most health issues that I help people with start from poor water quality. Uh, it may end in a bacterial infection or a parasitic infection or something like that, but it usually starts with poor water quality. Um, stress. So, I mean, poor water quality is a form of stress, but there are other stressors uh, and that can be a major source of issues as well, an initiating factor in kind of a, a disease event. Um, nutrition is going to be very important. I'll go over this a little more in a second. 
Um, good husbandry in general. Um, good biosecurity is certainly very important. Um, starting with healthy stock. So uh, you don't always have a lot of options for getting stock, depending on what species you're working with. But if you do have options, um, I would try and buy the healthiest stock that you can. Um, quarantine or entry treatment. So this is particularly important if you have um, more than one batch of fish on your site. If you uh, just finished a production cycle and you're moving all your fish off your site and starting with a whole new batch of fish, you don't have to worry about the quarantine part quite as much. But if you have other fish on your site and you're bringing in new fish, you don't want to throw them all together to begin with. Your new fish, you want to have separate to watch them and see if they do have disease that hasn't manifested itself yet. In some cases, especially if you're getting them from uh, outside ponds or wild fish, um, you may want to do some ectoparasite treatments to your fish before they even get into your system. Because uh, I certainly do see cases where you bring fish in from environments like that, they get all stressed out because they're in a new place uh, and the ectoparasites just kind of take over. Um, try and be consistent. So um, depending on the size and scale of your um, facility, um, you want to have consistency. If you're on a large scale, I would, I would encourage you to have some kind of quality assurance or quality uh, control in place. If it's a smaller scale, just try and be consistent so that you, if issues do arise, you can try and narrow down what those things might be. Um, and then know your resources. So if there are diagnostic labs available, if there are fish health professionals around, um, people that can help you with problems, uh, you should know them. Because if you run into an issue, you're not going to want to spend three days trying to figure out who those people are um, while you're losing fish. Um, and keep an eye on your fish. So. Um, it's not always easy to know what's going on with your fish. When you're feeding your fish is often a good time to see your fish up close um, and know what normal looks like for your fish so that once abnormal comes in, you, uh, you can recognize that as quickly as possible. So um, I will go over a couple of those things in more detail here in a second. Um, first, I'm going to focus on uh, some kind of common indications of disease. One of the big ones, uh, one of the first things that people notice is if your fish stop eating. So um, your fish should uh, have a, a healthy appetite in general. Uh, if they go off feed, it, it usually is an indication that something is going on. Um, certainly fish gasping at the surface or staying near the water inflow can indicate that they're trying to get more oxygen than is present in your system. Maybe you don't have enough oxygen in your system, or maybe there's something wrong with their gills. Um, but it's certainly a, si a sign that something is going on. Um, other abnormal behavior, so um, I don't know if you guys know what flashing is, but uh, it's basically when fish try and rub uh, their body against the floor of an aquarium or something like that. So they kind of are swimming and they go down like that and flash up real quick. It's usually a sign that they have something kind of itchy on their skin. Uh, it could be an ectoparasite, could be bacterial infection. But flashing is not a good sign. Rubbing against the sides of the tank, not a good sign. Um, and then also just kind of lethargy and uh, strange positioning in the tank can be indications that something is going on. Um, certainly the presence of any external lesions um, are worth looking into, and I'll show you a few of those here on the next slide, I believe. And uh, increased mortality rates. So uh, depending on how many fish you have, you may have a baseline low mortality rate in your tank. Um, but if you're tracking that and all of a sudden you're starting to see mortality rates going up, uh, it's worth looking into pretty fast because oftentimes if you're graphing this through time, I guess I'll do it for you guys, once you start going like this, um, if you don't th do anything at this point, oftentimes it's just going to spike. So if you are keeping track of this and you notice that there is uh, an increase, uh, it's something to look into sooner rather than later. So a few of the gross external lesions that are common in fish that get sick, particularly from, well, from a number of things. Um, are going to be the things that I'm showing you now. So this one uh, may be kind of hard to see, but this guy has some, uh, it looks like bruising almost. It's called petechial hemorrhaging, um, and that's uh, typically not a good sign. Um, so sometimes a fish can have tissue swelling, and so if that fish has uh, um, scales, those scales can kind of stick out, and they can kind of look like a pine cone, um, also not a good thing. Uh, oftentimes they will get fluid accumulating in their abdomen. 
uh, called ascites. Um, that's uh, certainly a sign that something is going on. Um, another st standard thing that happens with sick fish is their, their eyes will start to bulge out of their head. It's called exophthalmia, um, and it's usually a sign something is going on. Certainly if you see little white spots or uh, spots of any color on the outside of your fish that weren't there before, um, it's worth looking into. Uh, if you get something very fuzzy like this guy that almost looks like he has cotton on him, um, that's worth looking into. Uh, you probably won't see your, the gills of your fish too often, although sometimes if you are looking over the tank you can kind of see whether, whether the, the opercula are sticking out or not. Um, but any discolorations of the gills um, would be worth looking into. And then larger dermal ulcerations or things like that are obviously going to be worth looking into. Uh, so these are all kind of common signs of disease of different sorts. Um, so there are a number of things that can potentially be uh, deleterious to your fish that can cause health issues. Infectious agents or pathogens um, are going to be one of those things, and they often do show up. Um, major types are going to be viruses, bacteria, parasites, and uh, fungus or water molds. Um, some of those are primary, meaning they could make a very healthy fish sick versus opportunistic, which is something that would not necessarily make a very healthy fish sick, but if your fish is stressed out from something like water quality or something like that, poor water quality, then they can come in and take over. Poor water quality, obviously, um, is a big one, as I mentioned. Um, and then uh, stress can often be an initiator as well. Uh, and that can be from anything uh, like inappropriate housing, poor husbandry, poor nutrition, stocking density that's too high, maybe you're handling your fish too often, things like that. Uh, and then there are certainly some other causes. So um, I, I guess I, as I've worked with fish uh, and see disease manifesting itself, I kind of see, um, often see three standard kind of patterns of disease. So I'm basically going to walk through those with you just so you have a better understanding of how disease can manifest itself in fish populations. So the first trend uh, is kind of acute disease. So you have a bunch of fish. Uh, they're happy and healthy. Uh, you have some major disease event and you end up with a high morbidity or mortality rate. Um, so that can be caused usually by some sort of primary pathogen, some major water quality issue, something like that. Um, characterized by high morbidity and mortality rates. Um, and the initiating factor is typically also the factor that is causing death in the fish. Um, the second trend I see is more of a chronic type of disease where you have your healthy, happy fish here. Uh, you have some ongoing disease condition, and you get a low mortality, low but steady mortality rate through time. Um, and that is usually going to be from something like poor water quality, stress, uh, something nutritional. Um, it can be from opportunistic pathogens um, and some other types of chronic disease. Um, but as I said, kind of a low chronic, uh, steady mortality rate through time. Uh, and the, the initiating factor usually is the ultimate factor as well. But perhaps the most common that I see is acute on chronic, where you have your healthy fish. You have uh, some kind of chronic issue like poor water quality or stress. Um, you throw in something like an opportunistic pathogen like that, and you end up with a lot of dead fish. And this one is kind of confusing, because uh, if you send this fish into the diagnostic lab, they may come back with some systemic bacterial infection. But if it's an opportunist, uh, it's you, um, you potentially could treat that with something like antibiotics, but unless you deal with the initiating factors such as poor water quality, poor management, or things like that, you're not going to solve the issue. Um, so that's a good thing to keep in mind. Water quality, we have talked about a fair bit already, so I won't get into it too much, but I'll just say a few points. So um, it, is, it does seem to be the most common source of fish health issues particularly for people who are new to aquaculture or aquaponics, um, but certainly for, for other people as well. Um, so it can directly result in immediate and significant losses. So there are a few things that can kill a lot of your fish very quickly. Uh, so very low dissolved oxygen, for example. Um, very high total gas pressures. Um, I won't get into too much of the details here, but if you have more questions, um, I'll be around during the day. 
Um, but more commonly, poor water quality results in kind of secondary and or uh, chronic fish health issues. And a lot of times in, uh, that's going to be from, you know, your pH is not quite right or it's, uh, it's changing quite a bit from day to day. Uh, maybe your nitrites or nitrates are too high, uh, things like that. So good and stable water quality is kind of imperative to fish health. How do you uh, manage that? Well, know what parameters you should be shooting for. Have the right equipment and materials to be able to do that. So your, your, your system, uh, your tank system with filtration and all those things is really your life support system for that population of fish. Uh, measure your water quality parameters regularly and appropriately. Um, document these measurements and any adjustments you make uh, to your system so you can go back and look at them. Uh, know how to manage things if things are off. So if your pH is jumping all over the place, you should know how to deal with that. Um, have a plan for emergencies or disasters that impact water quality. So uh, if you lose power for 12 hours, is your system going to be able to handle it? Um, and then, so uh, certainly intensive and RAS systems, aquaponic systems may require a little more attention to water quality as opposed to some of the larger systems, um, but really any type of system is going to need that kind of help. Stress, so um, stress can have a huge negative impact on your fish, um, so you should um, start off by having a, uh, a tank system which is species appropriate. Um, but then other things to consider certainly are going to be stocking density. So how many fish are you going to have in your tank? Uh, are there social or behavioral needs? Uh, I used to work with salmon. You'd think that if you had a very, very low stocking density, that would be least stressful for them. But actually, that's more stressful for them than having the appropriate stocking density. They like to be in schools with other fish. And so um, that is kind of a social or behavioral issue that is good to know for that species. Uh, try and handle your fish as infrequently as possible. They don't like being handled. Um, lighting and noise can cause issues, and then uh, certainly several, several other things can cause stress for your fish. But try and minimize that stress. Try and be consistent. Uh, your fish will appreciate it. Nutrition. So um, you should be using species and stage appropriate food, if possible. So there isn't feed made for every fish species out there, but there are a lot of them for the fish species that are commonly cultured. And you should use the species appropriate and stage appropriate. You should also store that feed appropriately. So these are the two biggest feed issues that um, I'm, I'm used to having uh, to deal with. Uh, so just because you have the right feed, if you're not storing it appropriately, it can cause problems. You can uh, get uh, fungal growth in your feed, you can have lipids break down so that they become more toxic than they are nutritious uh, and things like that. Um, and then use feeding uh, as a time to look at your fish. So your fish may hide from you a lot of the time. When you're throwing them feed, they often come up to the surface and you can actually take a look at them then. Um, and then there are a lot of new feeds coming out that are trying to use alternative sources of protein or oils, which I think is a good thing in general. Uh, you just want to make sure that the product you're using is appropriate for your fish. Um, husbandry, so uh, ensure if you do have staff, ensure that they are trained appropriately, that they know what they're doing. Um, and then keep things clean in general. So not just your tanks, um, but your nets and your boots and things like that. Um, when choosing infrastructure, equipment, things like that, uh, choose things that you can clean. So if you have a, a choice of getting a, a wooden rack system for tanks versus uh, stainless steel that can be covered with an epoxy or something like that, the latter would be better because you can clean it off better. Uh, sometimes, you know, one is going to be a lot cheaper than the other and you don't really have a choice. Um, but you have, if you have a choice, if you can get something that you can sanitize on a regular basis, um, it's going to be beneficial. Um, certainly, if your tank is accumulating debris, you should remove that on a regular basis. Um, it can cause a lot of issues. Um, and remove dead fish as soon as possible. So um, they can cause a lot of issues, but certainly there are some bacterial species that get shed from dead fish at much higher rates than they do from live fish. 
And uh, so you just want to get those fish out of there as soon as possible. Um, and also use a fallow period if possible. So in your system, um, if you can, kind of break it down and let it dry out for a month or something like that, and then uh, ramp it up again, um, that is a nice opportunity to clean out your system of any potential pathogens that are hanging out in there. That's not going to be possible all the time, but if you can do that, um, it can be a good way to avoid uh, problems in the long run. You guys still with me? Okay. Um, so I'm going to go over just a few infectious diseases, um, mostly kind of categories of infectious diseases. Um, and I think I'm probably uh, less than 10 slides from the end. So um, not all fish health issues are related to infectious disease, but oftentimes infectious disease is contributing to the issue. So as I mentioned, some pathogens can make a, a very healthy fish sick, and these are considered your primary pathogens. Other pathogens do rely on other uh, things that aren't quite right with your fish. Uh, so it can be a problem with the fish itself. It can be an environmental problem in your tank for things like that. Um, and so in those cases, you really have manifestation of disease uh, where all of these things are, are not quite right. Um, if you're looking for a good book on uh, diseases of fish, uh, this one by Ed Noga is very good. Um, it's the one that I, I go to most often. Um, so I'm going to go over ectoparasites, endoparasites, and then bacteria and viruses, and then funguses or molds. So um, ectoparasites um, are pretty common in fish. Uh, and they live on the skin, on the gills, and on the fins of fish. Um, low numbers, usually not a problem. So uh, if I'm looking at wild fish that were pulled out of a lake, I'm al almost always going to see some ectoparasites on them. If they're at low numbers, the fish is keeping them in check, and it's usually not a problem. Uh, what causes a problem is once they get up to high numbers. Um, and that switch from low to high is often triggered by something like stress or poor water quality. And that stressor may be transport. So, I mean, if you're buying it from a farm, you're putting it in your tank system, that can be the stressor that takes it from a low level to a high level. Um, but there, certainly poor water quality in your system can, can do that as well. Um, we will, so symptoms of, of these things are going to be things like the flashing, uh, gross lesions, respiratory distress. So if these things are on the gills of your fish, oftentimes that causes uh, them to have a hard time breathing because they're producing a lot of mucus that covers the gills and they can't breathe as well. Usually to diagnose this, we'll do wet mounts. So one of the demos we'll do this afternoon in the fish health station is show you how to do a wet mount. And, um, you do need a microscope to look at the wet mounts, but if you have a microscope, you should be able to do the rest of it, um, and you could look at your fish at any time um, for ectoparasites. Um, there are a handful of treatments available. Most of them are immersion options, which can be tricky in aquaponic systems. Uh, I'm not going to get into that too much, um, but I may talk about it just a little more here in a second. Endoparasites of fish, so parasites on the inside of your fish, um, can inhabit many different tissues. Um, often they are asymptomatic, so often they don't cause disease in your fish, even if present. Uh, they often have complex life cycles, so in an aquaponic system, if it's inside in particular, um, you usually can avoid other uh, host species in that life cycle, so you don't have to worry about it as much. But when you buy your fish, they can certainly show up with endoparasites. Um, so most of them are uh, a worm of some sort, although there are a few other things. Um, but as I said, they're, they're mostly asymptomatic. They can cause problems at times, but in, in a lot of cases, people don't treat them because they're, they're not causing disease. They're not causing major production issues. Um, a few notes on bacteria and viruses. So um, there are... Uh, many different bacterial and viral diseases of fish um, species, different species. Um, some are species specific, so they will just uh, infect Atlantic salmon, for example. Others are more general, so they'll infect different types of fish species. Um, many, uh, if not most, are difficult to identify um, just by looking at the fish. You need to do more uh, extensive diagnostics to figure it out. 
And a lot of the things you'll see are a lot of the growth signs that I went over before. So these petechial hemorrhages or bruising, edema or the tissue swelling, uh, exophthalmia, ascites, ascites, darkening of the skin, and going off feed. Um, a lot of the bacteria out there are going to be opportunists. So uh, if you're keeping your water quality good, you're minimizing your stress and your fish are otherwise healthy, they're not going to cause a problem. Um, diagnosis for bacteria is typically done by uh, aerobic culture of kidney or brain. There are a couple other ways you can do it, but usually that's going to be done at a diagnostic lab. Uh, and then virus is also typically done at a di diagnostic lab through virus isolation or something like PCR. Um, for any disease really, but particularly for bacteria and viruses, uh, preventing disease is going to be the key. So having good biosecurity, making sure you're not letting things into your facility that don't need to come into your facility. Um, in some cases, there are vaccines that are available, but that's kind of limited to a certain number of species at this point. Treatment options um, are not great, uh, so you can't really treat a viral disease. There are a few that you can change the temperature and that may help, but that's, that's kind of your, uh, the extent of your treatment options for viruses. For bacteria, you can treat potentially with um, antibiotics, but you need to go through a vet for that. Um, and uh, those antibiotics um, can be bad for your system, certainly. So as we mentioned, one of the primary components of your system are going to be these bacteria that are breaking down ammonia to nitrite and nitrate. Uh, they don't respond well to antibiotics. So, uh, so you can't just use antibiotics in your system with no risk. So the last pathogen I'll go over is uh, generally called uh, saprolignia and causes a, a condition called uh, saprolignosis. Um, so if you, the easiest way to recognize it is if you have a fish and it, it looks like it has cotton growing on it or something like that, um, that's usually going to be saprolignia or something very similarly uh, related to it. Uh, it's a water mold. Um, you can diagnose it on something like wet mounts. Um, it's kind of, uh, I, I would say it's, um, it's pretty common in some scenarios. In a lot of cases, you're not going to see it. If I ever see it on a dead fish, uh, I don't necessarily trust that it was causing disease in the first place because it, uh, it's something that likes to grow on dead fish. So if your fish died of something else, uh, you can get growth of saprolignia on that fish. And I think I'm getting close to the end of my time, so I may kind of cruise through some of these things a little bit. Um, as I said, uh, for a lot of things, prevention is going to be the key. Uh, no treatment for viruses. Uh, a lot of subclinical infections can cause uh, issues that can uh, then uh, result in opportunistic infections. Um, use of antibiotics for bacterial infections obviously has its downsides. Uh, in a lot of cases, once you get to uh, being able to feed your feed with antibiotics, they have gone off feed, so you can't get the antibiotics, an antibiotics into them. Um, and then uh, there are a lot of uh, other things as well. So uh, potential development of resistance, uh, marketing. So if you're wanting to have a truly organic fish, um, you can't necessarily use drugs like that. Um, and then environmental contamination or risk to harm to your system. Biosecurity, so I've mentioned, um, and just a few notes on biosecurity. So you basically don't want to be letting any pathogens into your system. So depending on what type of system you have, if it's indoors, it's going to be easier to control. If it's outdoors, you may need uh, fences or things like that. Um, certainly signs don't hurt just so random people don't walk into the wrong place. Uh, you want to regulate everything coming in. So new stock should be tested for certain pathogens if they cause problems. Uh, you can quarantine those fish and potentially treat them. Uh, you shouldn't really be letting, well, uh, it depends on your system uh, and your facilities. But uh, in a lot of cases, uh, um, if you know someone has just been on another fish farm and they're talking about this terrible disease issue that they're having on their fish farm, you probably don't want to invite them to your fish farm. Uh, if you have a very large fish farm, then maybe that's a standard question you ask people before you let them on, their, on your facility. 
Um, and then if you have multiple populations at your facility, it's often good to isolate them um, because they can, um, if they're all on the same system, if any of them catch some disease, they can spread throughout. So for smaller systems, you may not be able to do this, but at larger facilities, it's always a good thing to do. Uh, disease diagnosis, um, I'll just run through pretty quickly. So uh, some things you may be able to diagnose on yourself, but a lot of things you probably will need help from a diagnostic lab. Uh, some of the things that you might be able to do on yourself, I'll go over this afternoon in our fish health section, basically a gross necropsy or doing these wet mounts if you have a microscope. But then uh, other things would include things like bacterial culture, virus isolation, PCR, and things like that. Um, I just have this one slide on disease treatments. So you want to make sure if you are treating your fish um, that you know what disease your fish has and you're using the appropriate treatment for it because uh, it can cause issues. Uh, you need to make sure that it's legal, so especially if you're raising food fish. If you're doing ornamentals, it's a little easier, but if you're raising food fish, you need to make sure that what you're treating your fish with is legal. Uh, and that it's safe for your system. So that biofilter in your system uh, is pretty sensitive to a lot of the, the drug treatments you might be using to treat your fish. So you just want to make sure you're using the right thing and using it in the right way. Um, and you should certainly try and identify any uh, initiating factors so that you're not just putting a Band-Aid on uh, the symptoms that are showing up, but you're not treating what the initial cause is. Um, I did throw on here a handful of fish health resources, so this should be online for you at the end of all this as well. Um, there are a number of them out there. And uh, with that, I'm happy to take any questions. So the question was whether um, there's a difference in the amount of ammonia excreted by carnivorous versus omnivorous uh, or uh, omnivorous fish um, and whether that's going to affect your system. So yeah, the, I mean, the amount of ammonia excreted should be basically a product of how much feed you're giving and the, the protein content of that feed. Um, a lot of times the protein content isn't going to differ a great deal even between some carnivorous and omnivorous fish. So I, I'm not aware of any major differences. Yeah, so maybe, maybe a little bit, but, but not too much. So the question was, where is the closest diagnostic lab where one could send these fish? Uh, and it's uh, about 50 meters in that direction. So. Um, we do, uh, we do uh, fish health diagnostics here at the University of Minnesota. Um, there are certainly other places around as well, but in Minnesota it's mostly um, us. The, the DNR does their own fish health testing. Uh, if you have a larger facility, there are some other places in the U.S., but in Minnesota, um, this is your main option. So how do you get the fish there? So uh, the follow-up question is how do you get the fish there? So to um, for me to be able to get my best uh, diagnosis, um, if I can receive live fish, um, that's ideal. So if you're within driving distance, driving them in, in a bag, um, in water, um, probably in a cooler, depending on how hot or cold it is outside. Um, if you can pump oxygen into that bag, great. If not, then just fill it up with air. But so live is going to give me the best chance to give you a good diagnosis. Second best would be um, in a cooler, uh, so with the fish in a bag on ice, but not frozen. Uh, frozen um, is, uh, does not help with the diagnosis. So the second best would be on ice in a bag, uh, but dead. But um, if I can get live fish, that's ideal. And if I can get fish that are showing disease signs um, in your population, that's also ideal. So yeah, I, um, for our necropsies, we do 
four fish, but I mean, you can send in, yeah, I mean, something like three to f six fish, something like that, and I can, I can take my pick. Um, but yeah, I, um, it's ideal if I get more than just one fish. Um, you know, so if you have three fish that are showing, obviously clawing, showing symptoms, and then may maybe three fish that are normal, you can send those in labeled appropriately on their bag, um, and I can kind of take my pick from there. But yeah, it's, mul it's helpful to see uh, multiple fish. I, ideally, um, if I were managing the, the case, I would, uh, my first question would be about water quality. Um, and so if, if there's a way that you can measure that water quality on your own, then that's great. Um, depending on what's going on, I may ask more about your systems and things like that. But having good water quality parameters as well is very important, uh, if, if only to rule out um, water quality as an issue. Yep, Don. If you're treating for disease in an aquaponics system, is there any concern about plants that are going to die or something? So the question was, if you're treating uh, for fish disease in an aquaponics system, is there concern about uh, the plants? Um, and so uh, there, uh, in terms of the plant health, uh, they seem to be more robust than the biofilter itself with things like antibiotics or formalin or things like that. Um, not a lot of work has been done on the accumulation of some of these chemicals in the plants that I'm aware of, but hopefully um, in your system the, the chemicals would, in there, would be in there in a short enough period of time that they wouldn't accumulate in plants. Um, so I guess I didn't have time to get into how one might be able to treat in an aquaponic system, but one of the best ways is if, if you can isolate your fish tank, just treat your fish tank with a bath um, flush as much of that water out as possible and then restart your system. That's ideal, but, um, but even for other ways, I, I haven't heard of having too many issues for the plants. That may be plant specific. Neil, have you um, heard of too many fish treatments causing issues with plants if it doesn't affect the biofilter? Okay, so Neil says always a possibility but haven't heard anything recently. Okay, uh, I think we may get started again. We've got two more talks before lunch. Uh, this first one is gonna be by Marie Abbey, who's a graduate student here at the University of Minnesota, and she's gonna talk to us about aquaponic productivity in Minnesota. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, as Alex said, my name is Marie Abbey. I just graduated with my master's degree in applied plant science. And today I'll be talking to you about the part of my master's thesis on the productivity of strawberries, lettuce, and basil in the systems we had here at the University of Minnesota. So before we get started, let me run through a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, first, I'll go into the experiment we conducted and give you an idea of the different setups we had because we had multiple, the controls we had, what kind of fish we used, and uh, where we got our funding, things like that. Uh, then I'll go out, I'll go into the results from our strawberry study, the strawberry part of the study, talk about the results, and then talk about what we can do a little bit better next time or things that could potentially improve yield since in our systems we didn't add any supplemental anything to them. Finally, I'll discuss results from the lettuce and basil segment of the productivity study. So our study was conducted uh, with funding from MinDrive. MinDrive is a partnership between the University of Minnesota and the state of Minnesota that aligns areas of research strength with the, with the state's key and emerging industries to address their grand challenges. So aquaponic industry was chosen as one of these uh, industries to be featured in the Min Drive, and that's where we got our funding. So the specific goal of this project that funded my research 
was to investigate what research was needed to help Minnesota's aquaponic industry. And from this, the production study was conducted at three locations. We partnered with Tangletown, Spark Y, and then we had here at the University of Minnesota. And we all grew the same cultivars of lettuce, basil, and strawberries uh, over a full year period. But the results I'll be talking about today are specific to the University of Minnesota because the, here is where we had the most comprehensive results with the most detail um, and the thorough data. So our overall objective with this production study was to determine if there was a difference between yield between produce grown aquaponically and with no supplemental inputs, as I said before, and produce grown in a greenhouse setting using soilless media uh, or potting soil. So later in the talk when I say soilless media, I'm referring to potting soil in a greenhouse. Furthermore, since we had several different types of aquaponic setups being used for the study, we wanted to know if there was a difference between the yield being produced in different growing, aquaponic growing conditions. So now I'll go into all the different types of systems we had, and we had many. This is, a, this is our deep water culture system in, in greenhouse C2. In this system, we had the fish directly in contact with the plants. Uh, for, to give you an idea of where everything is in the system, we have our plants here, our fish directly underneath them, directly in contact with the plant roots, and our biofilter sitting on top. Uh, when I say deep water culture, I mean that there is no significant flow of water over the plant roots. The water level stays uh, the same at the plant roots, and there is some flow, but it's very slow and it's not a continuous uh, system like an ebb and flow or uh, or an NFT system. In this system, uh, the rafts of plants float on top of the water with the roots hanging down into the fish habitat. And uh, this, is n this is not a very popular method of production because depending on what type of fish you have, they can do damage to each other. So in this tank, we had our yellow perch. But, and yellow perch aren't particularly interested in eating the plant roots, but for example, if we had something like tilapia in there, the, there could be damage to and impacts on your plants and your yields. Our next system was also a deep water culture. Uh, this, was, this, this is what we called our warehouse system. In this system, which was a manufactured by Nelson and Paid, which is out of Wisconsin. Uh, in this system, we have our plants, our fish, and our biofilter, which is hiding behind the fish tank there, uh, it, all separate. Uh, this could, we, the, we call this the warehouse system because it simulates a warehouse setting or a basement setting. It used all artificial light uh, on 16-hour days. And in this particular system, we're using koi as our fish and white LEDs as our lighting. The next system we had was our A-frame ebb and flow. In this system, we had koi in both the front and the back. Whoops, sorry, jeez. Here we go. And we have our, come on. Okay, sorry about that. We have our plants, our fish in these tanks behind here, and our biofilters sitting down on the bottom. The idea behind this A-frame ebb and flow was that it would save floor space by having vertical plants. Um, it, another thing to note about the system is that it was built by um, DIY by Jay Maher, and the biofilter is separate from the fish, which is separate from the plant. So again, all three of these are separated out into their different areas. Um, it's called an ebb and flow rack because the water is only pumped up and over the roots in intermittently. There's a sump pump in the biofilter 
that kicks on right before it overflows and pumps the water up and over the roots of the plant. Next we have another ebb and flow system. So we have a lot of systems. I'm sorry, I'm giving you a lot of information right now. This, is, this, is a, this ebb and flow system we called our tray ebb and flow system. In the front we had uh, tilapia and in the back we had goldfish. So we have our plants. This is where our tilapia lived. As you can see in the very background of the picture, that's where our goldfish lived and they were in separate systems. And our biofilter was on the bottom here. Uh, this system was also an ebb and flow, so uh, it intermittently pumped water up and over the roots of the plants. And, uh, the, and we had supplemental lighting for the bottom and middle racks uh, that was red and blue LEDs, on, also on 16-hour days. So now that we know all about the systems that we used, we can summarize them. So this is a table summarizing our biggest environmental changes between the treatments that I just explained. So there we had two types of aquaponic systems. We had our deep water culture and our ebb and flow. And then we had four different types of fish. And not every treatment had the same kind of fish. And not every treatment had the same kind of lighting. So the, the point is there's just a lot of factors to consider when we analyze this data. One thing that was consistent is that we did use the same cultivars over all treatments. So our experiment, we conducted the study for 13 months from January 2016 to February 2017, though the first harvest didn't occur until April 2016 because we had that ramp up period of our biofilter and we had to have a chance for the, the plants to grow as well. Uh, strawberries, lettuce, and basil will, were all grown next to each other in conjunction in all treatments. And we grew, grew three cultivars of strawberry, three cultivars of basil, and three cultivars of lettuce. And I'll go a little bit into uh, the, each type of cultivar we chose. So with our strawberries, we harvested the strawberries weekly, and we didn't distinguish between marketable fruit and unmarketable fruit. It was just fruit that was ripe. Uh, the primary measurements we took on the strawberries were number of fruit per harvest per plant, the fresh weight of the fruit, and the dry weight of the fruit. When, we when I talk about the basil and the lettuce, the primary, uh, the primary measurements we took for the basil and lettuce were the fresh weight of the plant and the dry weight of the plant. Um, to get the dry weight, we uh, dried them in an oven for a week, and then that was, that was to get all the moisture out, to see what the dry mass of the plant was, to see if there was more fiber or something else that was not water. Um, for the lettuce and basil, we took, we took weights every six weeks, and that's because we took one, we took the whole top half of the plant when we did our harvest. So we didn't let the basil regrow, um, which is different from a lot of uh, ways commercial basil growing happens, where they can get two or three um, harvests out of the same plant. So just so you know, this is one single harvest specifically for the basil, which may be uh, uh, a little bit different than what you might be used to if you grow basil. So we'll start with the strawberries. Strawberries are herbaceous and perennial, though they're treated as an annual here in Minnesota, even for field, field production. The first bud to flower is called the king flower. It's significantly larger than the subsequent flowers on the cluster. Strawberries bloom in a cluster. Uh, from this king flower comes the king berry, which is also significantly larger than the subsequent strawberries on the cluster. Uh, it's something to keep in mind that when you're, measure, when you're taking fruits off of a cluster as they continue to get ripe, you know, the kingberry is going to be the one that ripens first and you're going to harvest first and those subsequent ripenings um, after 
like after a week, those will be smaller berries just by the nature of the plant. Um, the flowers have both stamens and pistils, and they're able to self-pollinate. Um, let's see, the strawberries are an aggregate accessory fruit, which is important to note because they need to be fully pollinated to have uh, a round, nicely shaped berry. And finally, the strawberries are classified by their photoperiodic response. So when you go to a DIY, uh, pick your own strawberry farm, those strawberries, they're good, most likely going to be June bearing strawberries, which, are, which need short days to be able to flower and produce berries. The cultivars we used are day neutral strawberries. So they will, they continue, they don't need a specific photo period to flower and produce fruit. So they'll continuously produce fruit um, all year round. And they're becoming a, a bit more popular in the recent years here in Minnesota. So these are the, this, this is a significant result of the strawberry study in the table format. Uh, remember, we wanted to know if there was a significant difference between yield of aquaponically grown st strawberries and potting soil grown strawberries. So the first thing I did was compare the treatments by physical location. And I found that all three, all three uh, measurements, the fruit count, the fresh fruit weight, the dry fruit weight, were significant. Um, and so when I broke it down by plant location, or by physical location, I combined both the ebb and flow treatments into one because they were in the same greenhouse. And so the, I wanted to know after that, I wanted to break it down a little bit more and divide out those ebb and flow treatments between the koi, between the goldfish, between the tilapia, which were all in that one greenhouse. So when I broke it down by that, I also included the soil as needed to see if there is a difference between the fish treatments and the soil as media. And there was a significant difference between, in yield between the, the fish treatments and the soil as media in fresh fruit weight and dry fruit weight. So I wanted to know beyond that, is that difference only in the soilless media versus the fish. And so I took out the soilless media. And indeed, when I just compared the fish treatments across yields, there was no difference in fish treatments in strawberry yields. So this would mean that, um, according to this study, if you're growing strawberries, what type of fish you use doesn't particularly matter to yield. And finally, I, I also compared all the cultivars, and there was a significant difference in, in, in fruit count, fresh fruit weight, and dry fruit weight between the cultivars we tested. So here's it, uh, the strawberry results by, by fish and uh, soilless media included. Um, with the, let's see, did, did, so this shows that I have this circled because I found it very interesting that the soilless media had the lowest, lowest fresh fruit weight. So it didn't produce very large berries, but it had the dr highest dry fruit weight, which indicates that there's a high mass to water ratio in the strawberries grown in soilless media. Uh, and, and this might be a result of fiber. It, it could be a result of sh extra sugars that come from the soilless media. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I can't say. Um, and for those who don't know, uh, the letters at the top of the bars indicate significant differences. So if there's the same letter above the bar, then there, there's no significant difference and if there are different letters above the bar, there is a significant difference. So if you're looking at the top graph, there is a significant difference between yellow perch and soilless media, um, but there's not a significant difference between soilless media and goldfish, tilapia, or koi. 
Does that, that make sense? Sometimes that gets a little bit confusing. All right, so now we're looking at the, the differences between cultivars. So we had the three cultivars. We had Albion, Portola, and EV2 in our day-neutral strawberries. What's interesting is that while, so we had EV2 was the highest all over. It had the highest fruit count, had the highest fresh fruit weight, it had the highest dry fruit weight. But when you start to look at the second and third place in the uh, cultivars in fresh fruit weight and dry fruit weight, you'll notice that Portola had the second highest fresh fruit weight but the lowest dry fruit weight, where Albion had the lowest fresh fruit weight but the highest dry fruit weight. So this suggests that Albion has a higher mass to water ratio than the other cultivars, um, which could be because Albion has more fiber like I discussed uh, making up that makes up that dry mass, but it also could be because Albion has been found by other studies to have a higher brick score, which is the brick score is the sugar content of a fruit. Uh, so that's another potential explanation for why the cultivar Albion has such a high dry mass weight compared to relative to the other cultivars. Then I went and looked at, uh, did a literature review to compare our, our aquaponic results on average, average uh, fresh berry weight to what you would get from a field or what you can get from hydroponics or what you could get from high and low tunnel productions here in Minnesota. And there was a bit of literature out there comparing these different things using the same cultivars. So that was very, very convenient for, my, for me. So circled here in the aquaponic results are our aquaponic results here from the University of Minnesota. As you can see, uh, they are quite low uh, compared to other production. Just so you know, an average marketable berry is considered to be over 10 grams and completely and evenly red, filled and filled without major deformation. In terms of fresh weight, we didn't reach an average berry size of 10 grams in any cultivar for any month. Uh, though we, and remember, we didn't distinguish between marketable and unmarketable berries. We just took them all. It's really important, though, to keep in mind marketability when you're looking at uh, these studies and the studies we did uh, because it's we didn't, because you need to sell these berries and you need your customers to trust you that you're going to produce good, nice looking berries for them. I'll say it one more time, um, we didn't supplement the system with anything, so I'm going to go in a little bit of detail of what we could have supplemented to improve the look of our berries and improve the yield of our berries. So we had a little bit of an issue with spider mites in our system, uh, in, specifically in the ebb and flow greenhouse, which included the, the tilapia, the goldfish, and some of the koi. Uh, that was specific to, mostly specific to that one greenhouse. And the biggest issue is that if you're in a field or a hydroponic setting, you could just spray pesticide and it would have no, you'd have no problem after that. It's the most effective way to manage pest issues. Unfortunately, chemical pesticides, even organic pesticides, cannot be sprayed in an aquaponic system for fear of damaging your fish. And fish are much more expensive to replace than plants. So instead, you would release uh, parasitic mites and use biocontrol. Uh, unfortunately, these are not as effective as pesticides and they take two to three weeks to reduce, start to reduce populations of spider mites. Uh, they also need to be continuously renewed. Uh, when looking at the literature, having, it's estimated that having a spider mite infestation reduces day neutral strawberries, which is what we had, the yield by an average of 23%. So they do make a pretty big impact, even if they are still producing berries. 
The next solvable production problem we had was um, some fungus issues, specifically powdery mildew. It was uh, relatively controlled. We had it, an outbreak in the ebb and flow greenhouse again uh, for a, one month until it was under control. Again, you're not allowed to, well, you can absolutely spray fungicide if you want, um, but it is very difficult to protect your fish while, while spraying fung fungicide, and fungicide is toxic to your fish. What we did is that we sprayed a biocontrol called CEASE, which is Bactil Bacillus subtilis, which outcompetes the powdery mildew and controls it in that way. Um, it was controlled within a month, um, but if you do have a powdery mildew uh, infection, even when infection isn't severe, which is saying it's less than, uh, less than a 20% observed infection, there's still 5% average, 5% yield losses. So it's still affecting your plants even though you're like, oh, it's just a little bit of powdery mildew, it'll be fine. You're still taking that hit to the yield. Um, so during, to give you an example of what happened to our strawberries, during the month of November 2016, we had our infection of powdery mildew in the greenhouse um, of the ebb and flows. During that month, the total yield for the soilless media, which is in a separate greenhouse, was 2,300 grams of strawberries total. The same month in the ebb and flow greenhouse for both the A-frame and the, and the ebb and flow tray systems was 800 grams. So as you can see, it, it had a significant impact on the yield overall. It was then controlled, luckily, and, uh, and then our yields came back up. But if you have that, do control it quickly. Another issue we had, which is common to, I'm sure, all aquaponic systems, is iron deficiency. As you can see, for those who don't know, I should say, uh, iron is a micronutrient used in the production of chlorophyll and reproduction reproductive processes and strawberries grown in hydroponically are recommended to have 2.5 grams per liter of iron chelate included in the nutrient solution for ideal growth. We didn't add any iron supplements which led to whitening and continual whitening of the strawberries. Your strawberries are probably not supposed to look white or at least be completely white. It does impact your yield on your actual berries themselves. And the berries themselves start to turn white too, which is also not a particularly good sign. Uh, another factor compounding this issue was that we kept our strawberries as perennials. So we kept them in all year round, whereas if you're in a field setting doing like a pick your own, your you pick operation, you're gonna change out those strawberries every year. And you're only gonna have them there for three months at a time. So that was another factor that compounded the iron chlorosis issue. There are ways to solve this problem though, um, several different ways. To correct for iron chlorosis, uh, you would, if you were in a field setting or a hydroponic setting, you would simply add chelated iron directly to the roots of the plant, um, how, or lower the alkalinity to your pH down to six, about 6.5 to keep your fish happy and your plants happy. And that makes more iron available in your system. However, when, if you're considering added keeling, adding chelated iron to your system, consider what your, what your fish can tolerate and what your biofilter can tolerate. Uh, studies that have looked at iron or fish tolerance for iron have found that fish are not particularly good at uptaking iron, um, which is a good thing for aquaponic producers because that means it's harder for them to, uh, to become um, toxic, to get to the toxic levels of fish. So a soluble supplement may be possible. There was a study done by Rue et al. in 2017 that added two milligrams per liter of of chelated iron using EDTA, which is a chelating um, substance, 
weekly with positive effects to the plant growth and no negative effects to the biofilter or the fish. So you could add it. No studies have been done right now that I know of that have, have added like a, a wide range of, of iron supplements yet. You could also modify your fish feed to include more iron. That would, uh, that would get your more iron into your system. Or you could do foliar sprays to avoid the fish toxicity issue, but know that foliar uptake of iron in plants is much less uh, efficient than root uptake of iron. Finally, we had our we had a, our last production issue in the strawberries was the pollination. We didn't add any pollinators. We were, we relied. Uh, exclusively on air movements to fill our strawberries. On average, it's been shown that air, air movements pollinate, has a pollination success rate of about 60%. And pollination success rate greatly impacts your fruit fill of strawberries and subsequently your yield of strawberries. The addition of pollinators to uh, strawberry soil is media greenhouse experiments. So that would be potting soils in the greenhouse growing strawberries. The addition of pollinators to, to that, to an experiment done in that setup, that increased uh, berry size and weight by fourfold. So it'd be about 400% um, compared to those, the treatment that had no pollinators at all. So uh, the pollination success rate has a huge impact. You could hand pollinate or you could add pollinators to your system, but either way um, is highly recommended to do one of those two things. So to wrap this up, at least in the strawberry section, if there had been, if there had been su sufficient um, control of spider mites, we could add 23% to our yield. If there had been sufficient, a quicker control of our powdery mildew issue, and if we had added iron supplements and also had pollinators added to our greenhouse, it's very reasonable to think that we could have had an average berry size comparable to field production or hydroponic production or high tunnel production. Uh, as long as your strawberry essential needs, essential needs are met, uh, aquaponic production of strawberries is possible, but it does need to have those additional inputs. <coughs> oh, for the love of Christ. There we go. All right, so let's talk about basil for a second. Basil is a member for, of the mint family, and physically it's characterized by the square branching stems opposite leaves and flower spikes, but of course, we only consume the, consume the leaves of the plant. Sweet basil is the most common uh, type of basil. It's the culinary basil we all know and love. Uh, we grew three cultivars of the sweet basil. We grew Nufar, Eleonora, and Genovese. You're probably all very familiar with, with at least one of these cultivars. And something to note about basil is that it does not tolerate water stress and it is damaged in colder temperatures. So anything below 55 degrees will harm basil production. The US does produce basil, mostly in California and Arizona, but we also import quite a bit from Mexico. So that demand of basil as a culinary herb is not being met yet through, um, that, through US production. Let's jump right into the basil, basil results. So this graph shows the average fresh, fresh weight of basil separated by the type of fish, again, used in the treatment. And as you can see, the average yield of the two treatments which used koi uh, were significantly lower than all the rest of the treatments. This is really interesting because uh, these two treatments, the two different koi treatments, were in very different positions um, in the study. If you remember, our core warehouse was down in a basement using LED lights at a, a slightly cooler temperature. 
<coughs> whereas the Koi A-frame, it was an ebb and flow system. It was in the same greenhouse as the tilapia, same greenhouse as the goldfish, um, and, it still, and it still had a significantly lower um, fresh weight yield. It's unclear why basil didn't grow well with the koi. Um, I couldn't even hazard a guess to know why. Um, and just so you guys are aware, I didn't find any difference in the, the yields for the different cultivars of basil. So it didn't make any difference what cultivar was tested. Um, these results were still, still stood where they all, all cultivars did poorly, poorly in treatments with koi in them. So now we're jumping to lettuce. Lettuce is a cool season crop. It grows best with moderate daytime temperatures. Uh, it's categorized into two types. We have our head lettuce, which is just iceberg. That's period. And we have our leaf lettuce, which is everything else. Uh, our three different cultivars for our lettuce types were leaf types. We had Skyfos, our Salanova series mix, and a Rex Butterhead. As you can see, the Skyfos and the Rex Butterhead, those are both butterhead lettuces, whereas the Salanova series mix is more of a leafy type um, romaine. <coughs> but something interesting is that uh, head let almost all head lettuce is field packed for bulk sale or transport to a salad processing plants, and nearly a quarter of it goes to the, the prepackaged salads, which I found very interesting. Uh, in 2015, annual consumption of all lettuce was, was 25 pounds per person, with most of that, 55% of that being head lettuce, the iceberg lettuce, but 45% of that being romaine types or butterhead types, things like that. Uh, overall, the, the U.S has $1.9 billion worth of lettuce being produced each year, and we export lettuce. So we are, we are producing more than we can, we can eat, with the highest producers being in Arizona and California. So this graph shows the average lettuce yield broken down by fish treatment again. Uh, as you can see, the perch treatment, which was deep water culture, and had the fish in direct contact with the plants was had a significantly lower average yield um, than all other treatments. So that's the C1 right there, that's the lowest one. And the tilapia treatment had the highest average lettuce yield, which was interesting because it was in the same greenhouse, I said, as the ebb and flow. Uh, which was the ebb and flow greenhouse. So it was the same greenhouse as the koi A-frame and the goldfish, but it was still significantly higher than, um, than those two treatments. So this might mean that, that uh, goldfish are not particularly good for lettuce production, koi isn't particularly good for lettuce production, but some, or somehow tilapia are beneficial to lettuce production. So kind of interesting results. If you're growing lettuce, um, tilapia seems to be the most productive fish type to use. There was a difference in the lettuce mean weights between cultivars. Uh, we had Rex and Skyphos, as seen here. Skyphos had a higher, significantly higher average yield than the Rex Butterhead. They're both butterheads, but um, if you're looking to grow one or another, if you're looking for a butterhead lettuce to grow, whether it be Rex or Skyphos, keep in mind that Skyphos is a red lettuce. And if you're thinking about marketability, red lettuce marketability isn't quite as high as a green lettuce marketability, so that might impact um, what you can actually sell versus what you can produce. Maybe your customers don't want a red lettuce and they prefer a green lettuce. And finally, I'd like to thank MinDrive for funding me, my advisors, uh, Neil Anderson and Shang and Yu, and everybody who has ever fed the fish for me. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>
Questions? Lots of questions. Sure. The question was, do we grow our plants from seed? And the answer is yes. Yeah, Jeff. What uh, are you Yeah. With the iron, uh, yeah. In the white color of the strawberries, did the roots sweeten the score also change? Um, that wasn't so, we didn't take any bricks. The question was um, with the iron chlorosis on the, when they start to impact the berries and turn the berries white, does that affect the brick score? And in this study, we did not test brick score. Um, that when I say that there was higher brick score in the Albion cultivar, I was referring to a different study that had been done. Yeah, I would uh, completely agree, but I have no like scientific evidence to back that up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Great, thank you, Marie. So uh, we are getting ready to break for lunch. The last thing I was going to say was just to um, to give thanks out to the people and groups that helped make this happen. So uh, the whole program was sponsored by the North Central Regional Aquaculture Association. So they did give money to support the program, uh, support the, the production of the videos as well. So that's very important. The Center for Animal Health and Food Safety here at the University of Minnesota helped organize and facilitate a lot of this. Uh, in particular, uh, Anna Pendleton and Ann Bateman, who are back there in the corner, helped with a lot of the organization of things. The other people who helped organize this were uh, Neil Anderson and Nick Phelps, who haven't been seen up here yet, um, but they helped organizing a lot of it. And then um, all these different groups here, so uh, the CVM and CFANS provided the uh, venues down here and then up the hill, and uh, we're very happy to have our visitors from Ohio State as well. So um, I'm probably forgetting some people, the, the video production assistants and things like that. A lot of people helped make this happen, but um, so just before people uh, start dispersing at any point, I wanted to say that. So with that, unless there are any other questions or comments, I'll let you guys start your lunch and poster viewing.